Hello and welcome to History by Hollywood, a podcast series that examines the real events and people behind fact-based movies. This is episode 32, the Sunday, the 3rd of June, 2018. And today's episode is Saving Mr. Banks, a movie about securing the rights to the movie rights to the book Mary Poppins. It stars Emma Thompson as author P.L. Travers and Tom Hanks as Walt Disney. My name is Andrew Blischick and with me as ever is Martin Darlington. Hi Martin. Hello everybody, hello Andrew. Um, quick errata in episode 31, the TV special, I had a bit of a dig at turn, Washington spies for turning John Cinco into a total villain when in fact he did some good stuff. After publishing the episode, I remembered I hadn't quite watched all the final episode right to the end because it was sort of wrapping up. And I went back and watched it, and actually the series did give Simcoe credit for becoming governor of Upper Canada and indeed repealing slavery laws. So apologies to AMC's turn. And I also referred to Matthew McConaughey as Michael McConaughey, which is just plain dumb. Well, we'll forgive you, Matthew. Um, so listen to feedback. Scott Jeffrey of Alberta University wrote, I've really enjoyed the podcast so far, although I'm still in the process of catching up. Just finished episode 9, Waterloo. I do have a couple of suggestions for future podcasts. Lawrence of Arabia, I'm sure that others have suggested that, but I don't see it on the short list, and he's right. Others have, have suggested it, and we'll put it on the long list. And A Bridge Too Far, I just listened to a BBC History Extra podcast on Operation Market Garden, and they mentioned this film. I've seen it on TV, but that was years ago. Yeah, and both of those definitely on the list, uh, think, which we'll get to. The Bridge Too Far is quite old, isn't it? I think it was made not long after the war. Uh, well, it's 60s, 60s I think. Okay. It's, it's in that era of Longest Day, Battle of Britain. Right. Um, it's after Don mm, okay. Um And it um, had completely stellar cast. Dirk Bogart, uh, Sean Connery, Robert Redford. Right. Um, and it's all about uh, Montgomery's ill-fated plan to... Yeah, to basically to drop paratroop divisions and on the bridges the over Nijmegen, um, uh, Nijmegen, Eindhoven and Arnhem. Oh, really? uh, two American divisions getting the first two successfully and Arnhem, it was just basically had a single lo- lo- road through yes. Holland yes. to get the tanks up to relieve the paratroopers who were asked to hold it for two days. I think they held it for 11 before they were overrun, and it was so easy to stop the tanks. But you've, um, we've got plans to have an episode on the Battle of Britain in the foreseeable future. Yeah, so I think another <laughs> huge classic World War Two film, which we'll have to leave. Yeah. We'll, we'll wait a little bit. Yeah, but it's on the list for sure. Yeah, and what we can say is on the uh, pushing forward with the planned episodes on Sunday the 26th of August, we'll be doing The Darkest Hour, uh, the Churchill movie, which will tie in you know, it's, it'll be three episodes after Battle of Britain, but close enough to still to remain relevant. And then on the 9th of September, I think we're looking at Lawrence of Arabia, um, probably with Legend, the Cray Twins movie, uh, coming up just after that, that, which actually takes us very nicely to a message we got on Philip by Philip Pomerantz. Philip wrote to us on Twitter, and he said he's been binge listening to us over the past two weeks and has got up to the founder. Um, he said, since you like Tom Hardy so much, how about Legend About the Craze? That is a great suggestion. And uh, Tom Hardy plays both the Cray brothers. It's definitely um, one that has sort of been floating around our ideas. So we thought, yeah, we'll chuck that in for September the 23rd. And all of these will be added to the planned episodes list uh, by the time you hear this. So go to historybyhollywood.com and look for the link on the upcoming episodes and all the yeah, it, It's easier than typing planned hyphen episodes. Just look at the top of each page and you've got links to the other pages. Um, we've also had some feedback from Chip Down Patty on Twitter. He shared a list of books that have changed society and noted that Moby Dick made number 40. Just for interest, the top rated book was The Odyssey, followed by Uncle Tom's Cabin, then Frankenstein, James Joyce's Ulysses, and at number 17, uh, Ulysses was at, James Joyce's Ulysses was at number 17, I'm sorry, and Chip Down Paddy agreed that it's an unreadable book by any normal human. Yeah, and we also had a message from Bruce Plash. Um, thank you, Bruce, said he'd just listened to Mutiny on the Bounty episode, really enjoyed it, and then he made an observation about the effects of gravity in Tahiti which took me back to my teenage self watching the 1984 movie for the first time, and I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> um, and just a reminder that next episode won't be long for a month as we're having our summer vacation while some of us travel. But we'll be back on the 1st of July with 
Mrs. Brown, the moving story of the friendship between Queen Victoria and her gilly, or gamekeeper slash hunting expert, John Brown. It's super califragilistic, expialidocious, even though the sound of it is something quite atrocious. If you say it loud enough, you'll always sound precocious. Super califragilistic, expialidocious. So, first off, as ever, the story of the movie. Uh, Saving Mr. Banks was released in December of 2013. It cost a modest $35 million to make, but yet made $117 million worldwide from its cinematic release. So not bad work. Uh, it was directed by John Lee Hancock, who we last met as director of The Founder. The script was written by Kelly Marcel and Sue Smith. The score was written by Thomas Newman, another prolific score composer, and it was the original score for that movie that received its single Oscar nomination in, I assume, 2014, but it didn't win. No, um, just interestingly, uh, John Lee Hancock, as we just mentioned, as you just mentioned, uh, directed The Founder. Yeah. He's directed Save Mr. Banks. So one movie's about Ray Kroc and one's about Walt Disney. Yeah. And they served together, Ray Kroc, remember from the, uh, people may remember from The Founder, in the same ambulance company in the Army in the First World War. And we also have B.J. Novak, who plays one of the Sherman brothers who write the music in this movie. And he played Ray Kroc's uh, right financial hand advisor, hand. right hand man, whose name escapes me at the moment, yeah. who said to him, You're not in the burger business, you're in the real estate business. So, yeah, two degrees of separation. Very Kevin nice. Bacon stays at six degrees. This is two degrees. A little closer. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, back to nominations and awards. Um, after the Oscar, it was also nominated for a BAFTA, or for a few, but I think, uh, but it failed to win any of them, with Emma Thompson also being nominated for a Golden Globe. But once again, she was beaten in that award. The big, big winners of the 2014 Academy Awards were 12 Years a Slave and Dallas Buyers Club, both of which are on our wrong list. Yeah, sources moved by the movie writers included uh, Valerie Lawson's book, Mary Poppins, She Wrote, The Life of P.L. Travers, and they were also given access to Disney's own archives. And it is worth noting in our, not oh, cynical, but maybe um, just uh, objective way, just remember that this movie, which features Walt Disney in one of the lead roles, was made by the Disney Corporation. And so it's filmed on site at a lot of Disney sites. Yeah, they it gave them great the, access. They used Disney archives. Yep. Um, uh, unlikely to be a Walt Disney ev- uh, version of events. It might be the Disney version of events. Yes. We say. I, I, I once read a story which I thought was hilarious, and I don't know how true it is, that Disney employees received an email or a memo saying that any employee caught referring to um, the corporation as Mauschwitz would be instantly sacked. So after that, they all started referring to it as Duck Owl, um, <laughs> suggesting that the corporation have quite a uh, rigid view of yeah. how their employees should behave. Uh, behave. But I also believe that they're very good, if you're a student, if you go and work for Disney in your vacation, it's actually a very good thing to have on your CV. Yes, just like working at McDonald's yeah, too. probably because it's, okay, you can survive working there, you can survive working anywhere. Yeah, so Tom Hanks playing the role of Disney with Emma Thompson in the role of P.L. Travis, the author of the book, Mary Poppins. And on with the movie. Okay, so let's have a look at the movie and the reality check. In the movie, it commences in Australia in 1906, we're told. We see a shot of the sky and some clouds. The camera pans back to Earth and we see a rural outback Australian girl, Jinty, Australian actress Annie Rose Buckley, playing make-believe on her own in her front yard. We hear the voice of Travis Goff, her father, played by Colin Farrell, and he's reciting a poem. And we've got that clip for you now. Winds in the east. Mist coming in, like something is brewing, about to begin. Can't put my finger on what lies in store, but I feel what's to happen or happened before. Okay, so for the opening, if we just do a quick reality check, uh, P.L. Travers, the author of eight Mary Poppins children's books, Published between 34 and 1988. Yeah, long career. Yeah. Born in rural Queensland, Australia in 1899. At that age, she was Helen Lyndon Goff, and her nickname as a young girl based on her middle name, Lyndon. So she was known as Lindsay or Ginty or Ginty? Ginty. 
Ginty. So top marks to historical accuracy so far. The reason she chose her um, pen name of uh, P.L. Travers, we'll have a chat about later on, won't we? So that was Colin Farrell playing the Travis father, Goff. Travers Goff, we heard uh, just, just a moment ago. Reading um, a poem. And from what I understand, it's the same line that starts the movie Mary Poppins. Yeah. And I just haven't been able to confirm whether the book Mary Poppins is the same starting too. I just couldn't, couldn't get my hands on which kind of copy. Right. But well, before we launch into the um, meat of the movie proper, I have one confession to make. I've never seen Matthew Poppins. I'm familiar with the story, and I know the songs. I can say supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Um, but I've never actually watched it all the way through. I'm so sure I have, but not recently, that's for sure. No, no, it's one of those ones I've been spared, or, uh, well, listening to, we'll hear Mark and Mode later, described as one of the best ten films ever made. And I don't think you really need to have seen it to get the most out of this film. No, not at all. Just stand alone. Um, but what is it? I mean, Emma Thompson is fantastic throughout the film, so watchable. There's something really quite lovely about Emma Thompson. So we're just going to hear her comments when on... on playing this extraordinary woman, P.L. Travis. You said this is the best role you've ever had, but also the scariest? It's one of the best, for sure, um, and certainly one of the scariest. Why because scary? she was so complicated and contradictory, and you never knew what she was going to be like from one minute to the next. And normally you're playing people who are kind of more consistent. She was a very inconsistent woman. I mean, she's pretty nasty a lot of the time in this, but you have to see also that she's a very vulnerable creature too. Right, and she delighted generations of children, yet wasn't much for children herself. No, she, no, she wasn't. In fact, her own sort of grandchildren didn't much like visiting her. She was very fierce, rather stern. Absolutely, and she adopted um, um, one child, uh, and he felt that she had a very, very warm heart, but she was such a defended person, she found it very difficult to show that affection. So after our opening scene in Australia in 1906, suddenly we're now in 1961, uh, almost 30 years after the first Mary Poppins book was published, which was 34. We meet the author, Pamela P.L. Travers, by Lena Thompson. She's with her literary agent, and we quickly learn that Travers is a beautiful, sophisticated, smart, but a very grumpy woman living in London. Travers tells her agent that the armoured Russell, played by Ronan Vibert, that she's cancelled the car to the airport and she won't be travelling anywhere, especially not to give up the film rights to a book. The frustrated agent points out that she has a verbal agreement and she can be sued. But she replies saying, well, I've got no money anyway, so what can I sue me for? And the fact she's got no money is confirmed by the agent. Uh, so he says that sales have dried up and there are no more royalties. And we learn that she's been chased for the movie rights for her book for 20 years. And has finally got some pretty favourable con conditions. There's to be no animations in her movie, and she's got full script approval. Eventually on this day, Pamela agrees to venture to Los Angeles to hear the studio out, but promises to leave any documents unsigned if she's not happy with their interpretation. Then we get a flashback to uh, early 1900s Australia. We see Travis Goff, played by Colin Farrell, Surprising his daughter, the young Ginty, our, uh, the young version of our Pamela, he says he's looking for his daughter, a royal princess, and Ginty laughs and says, well, that's me. So we see straight away they're obviously close, they have a very playful relationship, he puts her on his shoulders, and they rush into the park with him saying that their adventure is about to begin. Um, right, I mean, the uh, reality of that, the scene setting the scene, or these two scenes, for much of the remaining film, it does portray how difficult the 62-year-old Travis could be, how reluctant she was to, to see to Disney. Sign, and yeah. sign away Mary Poppins. Um, she was a successful author. She first published poems in Australian magazines. She then became a Shakespearean actor, toured Australia and New Zealand, moved to England in 1924, changed her name to Lynn, Pamela Lyndon Travers, and in 33 began to write Mary Poppins, which was published in 34. As to the rights to the movie, actually, by the time we see it 61, Travers had already signed away the film rights to Disney, but she had authority over the final plot of the story. Um, but the first Mary Poppins book was already Disney's film property. And I think, actually, the first couple, because they did pinch bits from books one and two and put them in the movie. Not that they relied too heavily on the books. Right. So I think she signed away more than just the first book. In other words, but that would have been the principle that Mary Poppins was no longer her exclusive creation. Yeah. Um, as far as Travis Goff goes, he was a dreamer, he encouraged this in Ginty, uh, 
he was an Irishman, born in London, but very familiar with Irish legends, literature, poetry, and instilled this loving dignity. And he did say to her at one stage, Nee, we're, we're Celtic. Yeah. We're Celts, and we, you know, as an adult, she considered herself more Irish than Australian, and the move to London allowed her to make her origins obscure, and she would let people imagine she was Irish. Um, although she certainly does, we, we do have a clip later on of the real P.L. Travers. She sounds a rather well to do English lady. Yeah, poor British lady really. So, uh, yeah, she was in love with Irish poets and authors, and that would influence her throughout her life. I think so. Yeah. Back to the movie. Uh, it's 1961 again. Pamela is trying to load a giant bag onto the overhead locker of an aeroplane. A flight attendant asks if she needs help, but Pamela snooty and refuses and says she's perfectly capable. That, that's a line she uses quite a lot, isn't it? Thank you. I'm perfectly capable. Uh, she blames the nearby passengers for being greedy and taking up the space above, above their heads. The flight attendant suggests they put the bag up front, away from where Pamela's sitting. She, of course, refuses and says she's got to, it's got to remain close to her assigned seat. A nearby woman offers to have her own bag taken up front instead. Instead of thanking her, so which they do, but instead of thanking her, Pamela notices she has a toddler and asks if the baby is going to be a nuisance during the flight. She then settles into a seat and says to herself, I hope we crash. Yeah, and it's more evident to the grumpy and flexible woman who uh, we do gather is pretty accurate. But I've got to say, for anyone who hasn't watched this film, it is just fantastic. It's not twee at all. It is, I sat here watching it on my own a few days ago, laughing out loud. Yeah. Uh, the portrayal is just brilliant. Um, so we then flash back to 1906. So we've already gone back and forth, 61, 06, 61, 06. They do that, this happens a lot in the movie if you haven't seen it. Yeah, um, and we won't go through the, particularly the flashback scenes um, in great detail, but it's basically showing that the, their father has a good job, but um, he's, he's taken a new job, and the uh, Ginty, her three-year-old sister Biddy, uh, rather delicate mother Margaret, played by Ruth Wilson, um, yeah, she, if anyone's seen the series Luther, mm. she is Alice, the, the, woman, the yeah, movie. the sort of and the of the genius woman who, um, yeah, but that's Ruth Wilson, very well played. And Ginch is playing with her father, but they, he says, we're moving. And they pack the suitcases and they go off from a nice, looks like a nice house in the nice suburbs. And they end up in the kind of ranch um, in Allura. At the end of the railway line, you know, yeah. symbolically saying that they've fallen on hard times. So that yeah. little scene is pretty important. Uh, that portrays the family difficulty. So they're going to this sprawling ranch where they're, you know, not looking forward to, to giving up some of the creature comforts. And that's quite true. They did go backwards. The family circumstances did go backwards due to the father's poor work record. They did end up in the Queensland town of Allura, as the film shows. Uh, but he was demoted from the bank manager to a bank clerk for his performance. I'm not sure mm. whether that was the move to Alora or whether he was demoted while he was in Alora. But Alora wasn't too tough. It wasn't as bad as they're portraying. And from what I understand, they were still doing pretty nice. Even in Alora, they had servants to help them out. It was only later on that they got onto really difficult circumstances. Alora wasn't as hard as the movie suggests, I think. Okay, back to the movie in 1961. Uh, Pamela's on the plane, she wakes, uh, and they arrive at LAX, and when she walking, she's walking through and she sees a driver holding a sign with her name, and Walt Disney Presents. As if Walt Disney Presents Pamela Travel, you know? Yes. That sort of rolls her a bit, I think. And you're saying this is the first time that the film actually makes us aware that it's Disney that she sold the rights to. Yeah, that's right. It seems up until now they've been a bit coy about film rights and animation. But Spoiler! Is, yeah. Spoiler alert, everyone! <laughs> There's no one surprised we learned that she'd been talking to Disney. Yeah, we meet her driver, Ralph, played by Paul Giamatti, who greets her enthusiastically. He's a, he's a huge contrast from her grumpy persona. They go outside. She says, oh, it smells of something. And he says, Jasmine. She says, no, chlorine and sweat. And she's really snappy with him. Um, but he's just, he says, he's very optimistic. He says, isn't it beautiful, sunny day? And she finds him irritating and slams the screen shut. And he just sort of smiles to himself, doesn't he? Say, okay, no problem. That's fine. He drops her at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Uh, she checks in. The porter comes up to her room with her, offers to unpack her clothes for her. She tells him that if he wants to handle ladies' garments, he should get a job in a laundrette. The, the poor porter leaves without a tip. And Pamela then becomes horrified when she sees all the gifts that Walt Disney has had put in her room to welcome her. Flowers, champagne, a fruit basket, lots of Disney merchandise. 
but her biggest concern is about the pears and the fruit basket that's been presented for her. So she plucks them out. In reality, um, yeah, there's lots of scenes where Pamela's been snotty or disappointed by Hollywood and the Americans in general. Um, the exact scenes will be the work of screenwriters, but it does portray about how she felt about the whole, the whole thing. And the driver, wonderful character there he is, brilliantly played by Paul Giamatti. Okay. Ralph is not real, he's in an amalgam of several rough drivers who were the shape of Travis around uh, LA. But she did stay at the Beverly Hills Hotel, yeah. didn't she? Yeah, that's right. And the pairs will come back to later. Okay, so back to the movie. We cut back to another flashback to Australia and the Goth family sitting into their Allura house. It's a rundown shack on barren land, obviously heartbreaking for Margaret, the mother. But Travers calls it a palace and boasts that they now have chickens and in his smaller house, Ginty will have to share a bedroom as if that's a good thing. Yeah. As we've already said, the Allura house wasn't as, quite as bad as portrayed in the Yeah, and they had a couple of servants. Yeah, they did, they did, yeah. Um, back to the current day, or the Not previous the current day, uh, Pamela walks to the balcony, throws the pears she plucked from the fruit basket into the hotel pool, and then she starts stuffing all the cuddly toys, the Disney cuddly toys, into closets and cupboards, and Mickey Mouse, there's a huge Mickey Mouse in the be- on the bed, and she sort of sticks him so he's looking into the, he's stuck in the corner like a naughty boy, or sticking, looking out the window, and she says, you can stay there till you learn the art of subtlety. What a great line. Yeah. Um, she clearly doesn't like the idea of Disney being the one who adapts her stories into a movie. So she unpacks a bag, turns on hotel television, which I couldn't help noticing, came on instantly. Yes, to the, to the start of the show. Yes. How convenient. Yes. The um, show is. And there was no sort of that 30 to 45 second warming up that those of us remember Cafe oh, Ray yeah. televisions would be familiar with. And, and what show conveniently is on the TV, she just turn, instantly turns on? Yeah, it is uh, the Disney show, and she sees Walt getting all uh, excited about oh, well, magical just, dust. Uh, Tinkerbell, yeah, it's a bit of animation and in there. It's the first time we see Tom Hanks in the role of uh, Walt Disney. Which, of course, he's, he is excellent uh, in sure. portraying. I don't know how accurate it is, because I've not seen much footage of Disney, but yeah, he seemed convincing good. to me. He's a bit leaner than what um, portrayed by uh, Tom Hanks. Yeah. And he's a heavy smoker. I suggest that he smokes one cigarette and it's and busted out. Uh, so he doesn't ruin the Disney image, but he was a heavy smoker and he probably was on his start uh, decline to his, he died in 64, so this is 61, and he died right. of lung cancer, so he was probably a lean, thin, thin, thin thing as I remember him. Um, yeah, we, <laughs> another great scene with Ralph, and, and um, we do have a clip with Ralph later on, we'll play, um, we could have played all of these, because they're all very good, but watch the film if you haven't seen it. But Ralph picks Pamela up again. He's again friendly and gleeful about how sunny the day is, and she mocks him as if she's somehow responsible, reminding him this is California. Um, it certainly is, he says. And uh, then she says she'd rather be accountable for the rain. And he says, that's sad. And she says, but the rain brings life. And he quietly says, so does the sun. Uh, at which point she tells him to be quiet. Yeah. Uh, they arrive at the Disney studio in Burbank and they're greeted by Don DeGrady, played by Bradley Whitford, the film's screenwriter, and the Sherman brothers, Robert and Richard, who are writing the film's songs. Robert and Richard are played by uh, Jason Schwartzman as Richard and B.J. Novak as Robert. Don, Bradley Whitford's character, is friendly, but she is indifferent to him for not calling her Mrs. Travers, being too familiar in other words. She then chastises him for telling the Sherman brothers that she created Mary and not Mary Poppins. Uh, and we've got a little clip of this meeting here. Good morning, Pamela. It's so discomforting to hear a perfect stranger use my first name. Mrs. Travers, please. This is Dick and Bob Sherman, music and lyrics voice, the one and only Mrs. P.L. Travers, the creator of our beloved Mary. Poppins. Who else? Mary Poppins. Never, ever just Mary. Pleasure to meet you. Oh, well. Here we shan't be acquainted for very long. Why is that? Because these books simply do not lend themselves to chirping and prancing. No, certainly not a musical. Now, where is Mr. Disney? I should so much like to get this started and finished as briskly as is humanly possible. Perhaps someone can point me in his direction. I'd be so grateful. Thank you. So back to the movie, or with still with the movie, and she says she's not giving away any rights to the character because the film shouldn't be a musical or twinkly. And they try and take her on a tour of the studio, but she says she doesn't care. I want to see uh, Walt Disney. So then we uh, see her arriving in Walt's office, and she demands his secretary tell him that she's arrived. 
Don, uh, this is Don DeGrady, the screenwriter, he says, um, word of advice, or she doesn't he say, call him can I offer you some advice? Yeah. You can, but I won't necessarily take it. Uh, call him Walt, we're on first name terms, and she uh, absolutely won't do that, he calls Mr. Disney. And they go into a private office, and he reminds Pamela, who's been trying for 20 years to talk into giving the film rights, laying the movie's assertion that the film rights haven't yet been secured. That's right. Whereas, actually, we know in reality they have been. But we have got a um, rather sweet little clip with um, Walt Disney's very um, bonhomie character welcoming her and her reaction. 50 long years. <laughs> uh, I wish you could have seen me then, Pam. Lean as a whippet I was, a racehorse. Well, anyway, <laughs> now here you are, and look at you. Oh, I could just eat you up. Well, that wouldn't be appropriate. Twenty years ago, I made a promise to my daughters that I would make Mary Poppins fly off the pages of your books. I know what he's going to do to her. She'll be cavorting and twinkling. I won't have her turned into one of your silly cartoons. So we learned that uh, Disney and his daughters would have been reading Mary Poppins, and 20 years ago, he promised his children, his daughters, that he would turn the book into a film. And that's why he's been adamant in securing these rights, so that he can live up to that promise, as well as making kids happy who will finally get to see Mary speak and sing to them. Pamela uses this to bring up her disapproval of the film being turned into a musical, explaining that the governess shouldn't be giddy. She writes off Disney as creating silly cartoons. He tries to reassure her that he won't tarnish the story she holds so dear, because he also loves Mary Poppins. Pamela reminds him that he's not signed the agreement yet, she's not signed the agreement yet, and that it stipulates that the film will, will be live action and definitely not animated. She wants this made clear by a recorded statement by Walt, and so she turns on a, on a reel-to-reel cassette recorder and will insist on doing this for all the conversations with the Disney star. Mm. Disney remains calm, telling her that they're going to make something wonderful together. She responds by saying that she's yet to see if that is even possible, and then she leaves his office leaving the whole uh, poor old Walt dumbfounded. Yeah, okay, uh, let's wrap that up with a bit of reality. Um, we know that Disney contacted Travis over the rights way back when she was in New York during World War II. Over the years, he had visited her in the London home, they had private meetings. We don't know um, what was said in the private meetings, um, we just know the result, and he, he had secured. Um, he he wasn't the actually much. there much during this she, is it that's shown, though, is it? She's here for two weeks, in reality, as the film portrays, and we've already got some bit of a dialogue between the two of them, but you're quite right, he was on vacation for most of that two-week period right. in Palm Springs, I think. So, again, you can understand it. There were obviously lots of meetings over, over the years, and they basically conflated them into this one encounter for the narrative. And that's true. I can forgive him that. She's been difficult already at the start of this two weeks, and that is true. She was there for two weeks, and she was extremely difficult. And her real opinion of him, I mean, years before, she'd written a review of Snow White, and she said, oh, he's clever, this Disney. The very pith of his secret is the enlargement of the animal world and a corresponding deflation of all human values. There is a profound cynicism at the root of his, as of all, sentimentality. Yeah. So she, she's quite a hard blade. Yeah, she's she's not cloying or sentimental at all. She gives Mary Poppins in the books quite the darker edge sometimes. There's, mm. there's some dark magic about Mary as well as the positive, the fluffy bits, the fluffy bits flying in on the umbrella. Just to mention too that we've met the three Disney employees that she works the most with over these two week periods. That's Degrady and the Sherman brothers, and they are all correct. They yeah. they did all. Degrady was the screenwriter. The two Sherman brothers are real characters, and they did write all the original songs for the as we see them composing in the scenes later on. So that's pretty good. And, and as we'll see, um, Robert is quite uh, played by B. J. Novak is quite combative with her, and Richard sort of plays the peacemaker. And Robert has a limp, and it's mm. quite funny. She says, "Why does he limp?" And Richard says, "As it is, Robert's stomping away." Somebody shot him, and she says, "I'm not surprised," <laughs> which is which is funny. But he was actually shot um, in combat in World War Two. He was one of the first Americans to liberate the Dachau concentration camp. Oh yeah, yeah no, he, he he got the Purple Heart and uh, a couple of campaign medals. Well, so I hope the real PR fellas was more respectful to him. This one was. I doubt it somehow. So um, back to the movie. Yeah, back to the movie, and we're back in a flashback, and we got. Um, Travis, uh, Goff Travis playing a whistle while Skinty listens from his, sorry, Travis Goff 
Um, yeah, playing a whistle, Ginty listens from his lap, Margaret, Margaret the wife comes onto the porch and says she should go to bed, and alone on the porch with her, Travis promises his wife a good life to make her proud of him again, and she's hopeful. Mm. Oh dear. We get that one as well, but let's get to that. No. We jump back to 1961, Pamela, we see her in a rehearsal room on the studio property. She prepares for the meeting uh, stone-faced while Walt's secretary, Dolly, played by Melanie Paxton, fills the room with snacks and beverages. This irritates Pamela no end. She says the amount, the amount of food that they've got in front of them could save a starving country. And she complains that the flowers in the room would have been enjoyed from a window without having to be yanked out of the ground. She turns on the tape recorder to document all of her input since this is she, she has demanded creative control. They begin to read the script with Don reading the scene heading of Exterior 17 Cherry Tree Lane and they're using script uh, abbreviations. So it actually says EXT instead of exterior. Pamela interjects and asking, what, what is ext? Yeah. She then demands that it be spelt out and not abbreviated and that they should be number 17 Cherry Tree Lane instead of 17 Cherry Tree Lane. But they, they point out to her that these are simply uh, instructions to the script. The, these words will never be read anywhere, but she insists on spelling all this <laughs> stuff out. Yeah, she also says, um, absolutely horrified when they say Dick Van Dyke is going to appear in the film as the Cockney Jimmy Sweet. Um, and she said, and they said, but he's, he's one of the greats. She said, no, he's not great. Laurence Olivier, Richard Burton, Alec Guinness, they're great. Dick Van Dyke is not. And then they troop around it. Uh, and I'm not sure she was suggesting that they should be used in the movie, but I think she was saying Dick Van Dyke is great. And I have seen a couple of interviews with Dick Van Dyke where he says she hated him. She hated him. Most people do. Thankfully, Dick, uh, uh, Disney liked it. Yeah, but it's a running joke in um, Hollywood that the worst English accent in the history oh, yeah. of Hollywood oh, is this role. Yeah, try, dreadful copy but it's accent. almost become a, um, a cachet of its own through being so, so bad. awful. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then we have the Sherman Brothers singing the song they've written for the opening, and Pamela stops them when she hears them use the word responsible. Room here for everyone, gather around. Constable's responsible. Now, how does that sound? No, 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 no. Responsible is not a word. We made it up. Well, uh, unmake it up. So she puts them in their in their place musically, and this 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 time we see back at the piano, Richard is hiding the next page of sheet music. It's a song entitled Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, <laughs> and he clearly thinks she's going to hit the roof. She he thinks they're going to get rightly it. moves it to one side, doesn't it's he? Right. I just mind that, which is really valuable on an audio podcast. And then uh, to add further insult to their songwriting efforts, Pamela suggests why don't they work in the old portable song Tarara Bumpia instead of the original music that the Shermans, the Shermans are suggesting, which is quite the, the slap to them for all their work. Yeah. Um, the next session, they have a storyboard illustration. She finds fault with all of them. Says the illustration of Banks' house doesn't look like she imagines. Mrs. Banks shouldn't be a suffragette. She shouldn't be named Cynthia. And this is the point where we first see an agreement from her. So they start, Cynthia's no criminal property. She should have something a bit, I think she says sexy. Um, which does reveal a side of P.L. Travers that we'll get to later, yeah. the real P.L. Travers. Um, and, and eventually they agree on Winifred. I mean, since when was Winifred a more sort of sexy, sexy name, name than Cynthia? Cynthia? I don't know. Um, I don't actually know any Winifreds. Um, but, yeah, but that's the first time you sort of see them actually Negotiate. agree. Then she sees a picture of Mr. Bates. The proposed drawing, right? A yeah, a sketch of what it should look like. She says, no, no, he doesn't have a moustache. Um, she says, the only reason, and they said, yeah, but in the books, the illustrator has him with a moustache. She said, yes, but they ignored my instructions. This is my film. And Dolly, the secretary, says the moustache was a specific request from Walt. The moustache owed Walt. And Pammy says, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Banks is clean shaven. This is where we see Robert Sherman, played by B.J. Novak, erupt with, does it matter? <laughs> Which he's got a really, really good point. And she stares at him and this, she says, Wait outside. Like a school teacher. And, and yeah. he does. He yeah. does and he does, yeah. He stomps off. I think that's when she says, why did he live? Someone shot him. I'm not surprised. <laughs> and uh, just, you remind me about the illustrator that when I was reading the biography of her, that she had a very fractious relationship with her illustrator. 
she was forever demanding changes to the illustrations, and the illustrator was trying to create her own works of art as well. Yeah. And in the latter books, she was trying to say to the illustrator that she'll be kinder to her and pay her more, and so she was difficult all around, not just with the Disney company, I think. No, for sure. Then we go back to uh, back to the movie, and she's at the hotel, and she hears people laughing. It gives a flashback to her father, um, and, and he's shaving. And it's obvious that Mr. Banks is based on on her. Because uh, she says her father, yeah. There's this scene where the father insists that you need to be clean shaven because you want to get a kiss from, kiss from something that's silky smooth or something that's rough. Yeah. And so her ideal man, i.e. her father, needs to be clean shaven. Yeah. The next time she's at the Disney studio, she gets quite frantic after Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious is introduced. She goes, uh, oh sorry, Dolly goes up to Walt's office to give her an update and um, says that she wants Mrs. Banks' name changed to Winifred. She doesn't want Big Bang to die. She doesn't like the house. She doesn't want Mr. Banks to have a moustache. The tape measure used to record the children's science should be a roll tape, not a ruler. She only wants green vegetables and broth. The snacks in the rehearsal room. And she doesn't want the colour red in the film at all. At all. And Walt Disney, Tom Hanks as Walt Disney, is just like, what? what? <laughs> so he then comes in and says, uh, what's this about red? It's filmed in London. There's buses, there's post boxes, you know, the uniforms. telephone boxes, yeah, the uniforms. And she says, no, 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 uh, it's far too much red. I'm feeling anti-red. She says, well, we're in red lipstick. Yes, yes. Um, he, he asks if she's testing him. She says, no, I took you at your word when you said I'll get the final say on everything. So clearly she is testing him. Yes, um, ridiculous. And this is the stage where the rest of the writing team realise that Walt hasn't actually got the, the rights yet. So um, then Pamela says, can you sing another song? They sing The Perfect Nanny, and she's shouting criticisms throughout. We're being overrun by cats. Sorry, that's not in the movie. That's actually literally. Real life, real time. Yes. Um, I've got gaffer tape, you know. Tape them under the stairs cover. Um, uh, for any animal rights people, that was a joke. No, animals were harmed in the making of this podcast. Exactly. Uh, well, not yet, anyway. Um, yeah, and then she's shouting into the tape recorder. Um, nobody's listening to me as if her documented complaints will then hold some merit and the song finishes and Pamela says it's the worst song she's ever heard so and she's awful she's, she's terrible terrible and this is just more evidence again that you know no reality behind all of this it's really good scenes about how difficult she can be it captures the tone of what would have happened during two weeks but we can't put a comment on the precise accuracy no um, then later that afternoon Walt staring out his window, sees Pamela sitting on a bench and then get into the limo after Ralph arrives. And then back at the hotel, she has another memory, Pamela has another memory, about going to the bank where her father works because it's a specialised cream day. But Travers is drunk and he's fired by his employee or employer all in front of Ginty. And the boss finally agrees to hire him back, having seen the daughter, but says he needs to straighten himself out for his daughter's sake. And a few months later, they're sat by the river. She eats an ice cream and he drinks from a hip of glass and gives a drunken speech. And that's a, pretty much true, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. He, 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 he was, was a drink, Yeah, he was alcoholic. He would have drunk one work and he didn't get demoted at all he said because of performance. So that's fairly accurate. We then see Pamela, back in 1961, call her agent from the hotel room complaining about the adaptation of her story and, how she's having, and now she's having flashbacks to her childhood. But she has to admit that they need the money. She and the agent need the money. After hanging up from the phone, she pulls the giant Mickey Mouse from the window and cuddles it. Yeah, we see the rehearsal room does get healthier options for food, as she'd requested. And um, the Sherman brothers are brainstorming ideas and they come up with the uh, very well-known song, The Spoonful of Sugar. Um, we see Walt meet Pamela at the limo and escort her upstairs. And they uh, play the new song, Spoonful of Sugar. But decide, the brothers decide the word down should be played higher. Oh. Yeah. Um, along the lines of Mary Poppins doing the unexpected, like going up the banisters. And they love the song and predict it will become iconic. Pamela says it's uh, annoying and it's akin to something they would play at Walt's themed park or giddy and carefree. And she points out to Walt that Mary Poppins is the enemy of sentiment and whimsy, that she's truthful and doesn't sugarcoat the darkness to the children. She complains that the script is a flim flam and not rooted in reality, as if Mary Poppins somehow is. After describing it as no weight, she opens a window and flings the pages out, pro- 
proving that the script literally has no weight. Yeah, and I, I don't know if this seems true. Um, I don't know. I've not either. managed to find a reference no, to her no. actually throwing a script out the window, but you'd think for confidentiality, you wouldn't want to no, do no. that. It's but also, that, that's really, that's so inflammatory, and I think, at that point. So yeah. just say, right, I've had enough of you. But, um, what, what responds <laughs> by saying, uh, says the woman who sent the flying nanny with a talking umbrella to save the children. Pamela responds. But that, see, that, that, that's a good comment. It is a good comment. Because it's like you're worried about uh, what not, something not being real, me, something not being not, real, not being grounded in reality. But she comes straight back and picks on the one bit that he probably went too far and says, "You think Mary Poppins is saving the children?" And Tom Hanks does that thing we were praising Tom Hardy from communicating with his eyes, and you see a little light come on in his eyes, like. Ah, and he's just got an angle on it. Yeah. And I think he then realises, no, this is about saving Mr. Banks, hence the title of the movie. Yeah, that's right. So this, I think this maybe this is the point where Walt thinks, Walt Disney says things, I know how to get her on get the side. Get on the good side. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Pamela, we then see Pamela uh, at the same bench she'd been in before, outside the studio. She's thinking back to playing with the laundry, hanging outside when her dad comes home early, so we're back in Australia again. They're chasing a hen who Travers says is their foul Aunt Ellie in disguise. During this game, Pamela's mum notices a whiskey bottle protruding from her husband's pocket. That night, Ginty stays awake at night while her parents argue. The mother is suggesting that Aunt Ellie come over to help the family raise the girls. Mm. Do we want to talk about Aunt Ellie? Now? Um, Maybe a bit later. Yeah. So, so Aunt Ellie's been raised as the ogre for some reason, according to her father. Sure. Um... In the rehearsal studio the next day, uh, Richard is previewing Feed the Birds, which Walt finds really nice, and they worry that Pamela will hate it. Another flashback you see, again, Ginty and her father playing the sort of make-believe. And Travis says, don't ever stop dreaming, you can be anyone you want to be. And she says, I want to be like you. And he says, don't. And then he starts crying. So he, he, he's got some self-awareness. Yeah. And it is really well played by Colin Farrell. It does. A funny actor. He, I've seen him be brilliant in some things, and and I'm not saying he's dreadful. I think he's miscast in some Could things, be. like Alexander was yeah. awful. It was an awful film, but he's good in this. He's really he good in nice, this. I've seen him in nice quite a few things where he's really, really good. Yeah, um, maybe he doesn't need a new agent. Yeah. Um, so don't stop drinking. You can be the man you want to be. Yeah, she wants to be like him, and he says, "Don't." Um, he begins crying. And then, then she's being driven by Ralph and he's talking, but she's, she's, her memories keep flowing and Gins is giving a speech at a school fair and her father's going to be presenting medals. Then we cut back to the rehearsal room and the, uh, the writing team perform the Fidelity Fiduciary Bank song. And this is juxtaposed with another fantasy of her father showing up to the fair to give these presentation medals drunk. Yeah. When he presents the medals... He tries to promote the bank, and he says uh, that he works at saying, you know, banks are a good thing, we need to encourage saving. That's why the Fidelity Fiduciary Bank is playing in the background in 61, and she's remembering the drunk father promoting banking in 1906. Uh, as the bank song continues in the present day, it's repeated in the dialogue and flashback. Finally, when Travis is supposed to present the medals, this is the father at, back in 1906. He slurs his speech. He tells everyone that his daughter is over the bank account and the crowd should all give her a drink. He quickly corrects himself, saying, uh, give her a hand. Yeah. There was a bit of a gasp from the audience when he confused his drink and mm -hmm. mentioned that it's a drunken speech giver. He calls her up on stage, but she's embarrassed and feels crushed as her father was or remains her hero. Somehow on the way out of the stage, he loses his footing and falls off the stage onto the ground and the, gasp, the crowd gasps again, judgmentally. Yeah, cutting back to the studio, and the brothers, uh, the Sherman brothers, are applauding their new song along with Walt, and Pamela is absolutely horrified and said, Why did you have to make him so cruel? Referring to Mr. Banks in the song. He was not a monster. She says, She asked them if they have children, and they say yes. She says, Look, why have you got him doing all these mean things that you've got him doing? Mr. Tearing Banks. up the advertisement the children have written, refusing to mend their kite. And it's now obvious that she's very, very protective of Mr. Banks' image and has issues with the story. She says she can't bear to let him down again and leaves the room upset. And again, you get this Disney going, uh, okay, yeah. So it's a great, clever scene, the way that they've really this, this banking song that's music in, in the movie, and they've uh, got her flashbacks to her father, bank, yeah. public embarrassment, and that really 
confuses our mind that Mr. Banks is Mr. Goff. In a flashback, we see Goff travels in bed with a broken foot. He asks the doctor for painkillers, but the doctor realizes he just wants the high. And after he leaves, he, uh, after the doctor leaves, travels gets Ginty to get him a bottle of medicine that her mother has hidden. Uh, I think Outside, it's actually the woodpile, or yeah, whiskey or brandy. Yeah. She tries to share a poem for him that she wrote at school. Uh, he reads it and just says, it's hardly yeats, is it? She's devastated. And we kind of see that this is a turning point in Pamela's life. We then see Pamela rush through the Disney lot. This is back in 1961, yeah. yeah. And she finds a quiet spot on the lawn in the back of the sound stage. She has more flashbacks. We see Ginty, the young Ginty finding the bottle of medicine and leaving it with her sleeping father. Pamela, back in 61, is daydreaming with a daisy when Ralph the driver catches her. He's brought her tea, but Pamela tells him with blasphemy to drink tea from paper cups. Nevertheless, she lets him have a conversation with her, despite being obviously upset. She tells him she wants to go back to England and points out that she doesn't really have any close family members. He tells her that his daughter is handicapped and it's, and it's made uh, him appreciate sunny days where she can sit outside in the garden and not be cooped up inside like on rainy days. A flashback to their first meeting, or one of the first meetings where he says a sunny day is a good thing and she prefers the rain. Now warming to him, Pamela shows off a park that she has built in the grass, a mini park with the twigs, and she creates a, a, a moat in the ground and pours her tea to make a stream. Yeah, and it's a, it's a good scene because it's the first time, I think, that we and Ralph see, we know that she's created these Mary Poppins books, so she is creative. It's the first time we've seen her be a bit carefree. Playful, bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A bit of stern absolutely. mom, matron. Yeah, um, then we have another flashback and we see Margaret entering Ginty's room. Uh, yeah, Mar uh, Mother Margaret entering the young Ginty's bedroom at night saying, I know you gave your father the bottle of pills. Um, I'm aware you love your father more than, more than me. One day you'll understand that you need to look after your sister. And she leaves the house and uh, Ginty then has to sort of comfort her younger sister and then she goes out looking for her mother and she finds her wading into the freezing water of the local creek and she uh, sort of manages to talk around. She's clearly off, it. off to commit suicide yeah. with her mother. Yeah, that scene, that's what they're trying to, trying to suggest. And well, that, in reality, that did happen, didn't it? Or the, the mother abandoned them, didn't she? She basically walked out of them and, and then and did attempt he, suicide. Yeah, and handed them over to relatives to raise and see, yeah. I think, in a, in a nice suburb of sitting from memory. So there's not a lot of reality other than the suicide scene, suggested suicide of the creek, was accurate, but just a little bit too early. Uh, the, all the other stuff, the conversations with Ralph and the flashbacks and the singing of the songs in the studio, it's nice storyline. We can't really comment on the accuracy historically of it. No. Back, Back to, to 1961, and Pamela gets a phone call from Walt Disney. He wants to know why she's been upset. She doesn't really have a response. And he says, why don't we go to Disneyland? And she basically can't think of anything worse, but eventually agrees to go. And she says it's just a dollar printing machine, but he, he says she's going to pick her, pick her up anyway. And then we get this flashback to Aunt Ellie arriving at the Goth house. I mean, this is Mother Margaret's sister, sister isn't it? Right. Yes. Um, and I haven't got here who played her. Rachel. Rachel. Uh, it's Rachel Griffiths. It's Rachel Griffiths, right. Um, yeah, very stern face with an extraordinary hairstyle. Yeah, uh, looks like a giant sort of halo, and um, she's also a got parrot-headed umbrella and a giant carpet bag, all trademarks of Mary Poppins. So we learn in the movie that she's obviously the inspiration for the Poppins character. Yeah, she tells Ginty's sister to close her mouth because she's not a codfish. Again, a line from the yeah, I missed Mary that. Poppins. Well, I'm but she puts the girls to work and is very strict with them. So we've, we've hinted at that. Okay, so let's have a talk about Auntie Ellie. Yeah. The, the, yeah, as we've already said, this suggests that Auntie Ellie is the prototype for Mary Poppins, and this is in fact true. Unlike the film, uh, Poppins, the Poppins book, while magical and often whimsical, uh, originally had a very dark side. She was stern, just like Aunt Ellie is shown in the movie, yeah. and could be very harsh with the children, and this is how Travis remembers her Aunt Ellie, supportive but stern. Aunt Ellie would be a big part of the Goss family life, especially after Travis Goss passed away at the age of 43. So we're not giving away anything if you haven't seen the film. You can tell even from our dialogue that, that Father, Father Goff is uh, going downhill quickly and likely yeah. to, to drop off in a Hollywood fashion soon. And to be honest, if you're being brutal, probably uh, that's yeah. best for everybody. Yeah. Except maybe him. Yeah, except maybe him. 
back to the movie? Yeah, and we see Ralph uh, drives Pamela to Disneyland, and he's absolutely um, amazed to see Walt Disney there, and he realises that Ralph's never actually met his boss. Um, so she gets out of the car, and the two walk through, and young fans ask for Walt's article, autograph, and he gives out pre-signed pictures, um, which she finds sort of just so In, arrogant yeah. or... Yeah. Um, yeah, arrogant and not humble at all. And, you no. Know, but I mean, then again, probably very American, very efficient. Yeah. Um, and he, he says, you know, oh, would you like... Uh, get, this is uh, the author of uh, Mary Poppins. Would you like her to sign picture. something? And she mockingly rejects the checks them. Um, then they go down Disney Main Street and... He's trying to find out more about her, I think, isn't he? So, trying okay, to get the angle that yeah, you've already mentioned. You know, where are you from? And uh, or, or she says, where did she come from? And Pamela knows he means Mary Poppins. And she says she flew into a window one day. But he, he's trying to dig in, isn't he? And, and get under her skin and find out. I think he, he's got some angles working. Yeah, yeah. And he, he needs a bit more. And then they have this carousel ride. They do, they go on King Arthur's carousel. I believe she never did. I doubt it very much. I don't know if she went to Hollywood, but he was on vacation. To Disneyland, you mean? To Disneyland, yeah. I believe she did visit, oh, and, okay. and, and she was taken there, and I'm not sure if she stayed long. I don't right. think she went on any rides. Yeah, and um, so we've got Walt Disney trying to convince her to go on the most tame of rides, the, the merry-go-round. And she says, no, she won't, and eventually Walt wears her down and says to us, then, get on the horse, have a laugh. He then tells her the Sherman brothers have an idea for Mr. Banks that will be to her liking. She asks if he brought her all the way to Disneyland just to tell her that. He responds, no. He'd made a bet with the guy back at the studio that he could get her on a ride, and now he's just, one, he's just earned 20 bucks. Yeah. Uh, then we have a, a brief flashback, and it's Aunt Ellie taking care of Travis, who's coughing up blood. So as soon as you see that in a film, like someone That's coughing it. up blood, you're on your way out, son. And, and very quickly, back to the rehearsal room, and then we have Don eager to show Pamela the new scene they've written for Mr. Banks, where he does repair the kid's kite, and he sings, let's go fly, fly a kite. We've just got a little clip of that now. Oh, let's go fly a kite up to the highest height. Let's go fly a kite and send it's soaring up through the atmosphere, up where the air is clear. Oh, let's go fly a kite. So um, the main reason I've put that clip of that particular song in is when I was playing around and editing earlier this week, uh, I got an earworm from that song, which stayed with me for about 36 hours. And uh, as Andrew and I both like to share everything with our dear listeners uh, I've just inflicted that on you but it does tell a story doesn't it we were just talking off air then and any song that can get inside your head and stay there for a long time they're, they're, they're doing you something might not right. like it but they're doing something right yeah mission accomplished so we see yeah this is Pamela quite a, a, a listening to this pivotal scene, jaunty song it? jaunty song that we does get in your head and she maybe has come reconciled that she, you know, she needs to melt a little bit in front of these people. And we see her feet slowly start tapping away to this song. Yeah. And by the end of the scene, she's up and dancing and really enjoying this tune. Yeah, she's dancing with Don, isn't she? And yeah. Dolly runs in to walk this and says, whoa, whoa, you won't believe it, she's dancing. Yeah. And, and he's, he's like, we can't, can't be referring to P.L. Travis, so who are you talking about? And, he, he, and she yeah. is. And so he comes yeah. out to witness all of this. And just to remind us who she is, after she clearly loves the song and thinks it's great and it's a good message, she can't help herself and said that we might need to reword it in proper English and it should be, let us go and fly a kite. But uh, maybe she she'll have a look Let it. us go and, and fly a kite. kite. And they <laughs> just stare at her with a kind of, really? Yeah. Okay. That's a pivotal scene. And then I think she says sort of like, but maybe it's not that important. Yes, yeah, so I can, yeah. I can, I can overlook this though. So yeah. that's an important scene, but in fact, it never quite happened. She never liked the fact that it was a musical, refused to say that she liked any of the songs, even Let's Go Fly a Kite. But yeah. it's a nice scene. It is a nice scene. So back to a flashback in uh, 1900s Australia, early 1900s. Mm -hmm. We see Ginty sitting with her father in his bedroom. She says she's rewritten the poem that he didn't like, but he doesn't reply. She shows him the tuppence that Aunt Ellie had given her and asks if he wants anything. He asks for pears. Ginty steps out to get some pears. In the present day, back in 1961, 
Pamela awakens in a hotel room from her dream, a memory of the day that her father died. Yeah, so we have the pairs mentioned again. From the throne in the swimming pool when she first arrived. Yeah. And, and so this is the, the, the memory link, with, isn't it? With her father's death, pairs the bad news. Yeah. Uh, and again, not true, but a nice plot device, I guess. Yeah. Um, back to the cinema, uh, back to the cinema, back to the cinema studio, back to Disney Studio, and riding the limo, Pamela suddenly become quite upbeat, matching Ralph's optimistic look on life. Then in the rehearsal room, she's suddenly much more pleasant. She okays the Jolly Holiday song. But then she asks out, she says, hey, can you really train penguins to dance? As the scene suggests. And Robert yes. and Don are sort of looking at each other with kind of, okay, this is awkward, but we'll get round it. And Richard it is, says, no, they're, they're on, animated. As if, like, of course they're animated. You can't, train, woman. You can't, train, can't train penguins. And she's like, What? And that's it, storms out, doesn't she? Walt Disney's office, you're a fraudster, a sneak, you lie. Trickster, yeah. Yeah. She tells him that the music the Sherman Brothers has charmed her, but she won't cross the line and allow any animation or dancing penguins. She gives him back the unsigned rights paper and says, good day. Walt chases after her, but she just tells him she isn't, he isn't living up to his promises. Ralph, the driver, arrives and is about to drive her away. She tells Walt Disney she's sorry to put him through so much trouble, but she is not ready to give her Mary Poppins up. They drive away. We see Pamela arriving at LAX. Ralph tells her it was a pleasure driving her, which she doesn't believe. He says he didn't know who she was until he mentioned to his daughter that he was driving around a Mrs. Travers for Walt Disney, and the daughter made him go to her bedroom and take the Mary Poppins book down. Ralph then says he can't stop reading it. Pamela says she'd be honoured to sign it, and we've got a little clip of that. Yeah. Jane and her dearest... Father. I've just this instant realised I don't know your name. Ralph. Pamela. Pamela. You're the only American I've ever liked, Ralph. Oh. Well, may I ask why? No. Now, take this. Albert Einstein, Van Gogh, Roosevelt, Frida Kahlo. Carlo. Carlo? What is this? They all had difficulties. Jane can do anything that anyone else can do. Do you understand? <laughs> oh, almost forgot. Turn it around. Walt Disney. Hyperactive behavior and deficiencies in concentration. It explains everything. That uh, great clip, and I love that bit where that, that's so Emma Thompson playing P.L. Travers. Where she says, You're the only American I've actually liked. And he said, Oh, thank you very much. May I ask why? No. And then just carries on, but yeah, really so, sweet scene. So back in his office, we see Walt Disney looking down at the paperwork uh, with Pamela's flight itinerary, confirming that she has in fact gone back to London. He worries. He worries why her name wonders, wonders why her name is listed as Helen Gott on all these papers. And her secretary points out that that's her real name and that she's actually Australian, not British. So we, Walt then wonders where she got the name Travis in a flashback back to 1906. Ginty comes home with the pears and discovers Ellie holding a bloodstained sheet. She drops the bag of pears onto the floor. She rushes, Ginty rushes past her mum and aunt and steps into her father's bedroom. She watches him die and she apologises for dropping the pears. Yeah. The, um, it's a really neat scene where they um, link everything back to the fact that she's Australian and there's this goth person who's the little girl that's dropping the pears and all that. Cinematically, it's very, very good, but the truth is a little bit different. Yeah, I mean, the releva relevation that she had a different name, she's Australian, would eventually become public knowledge. But, um, many years Yeah, and, and some of her quite close friends, which she did have, which the way you see her portrayed, you'd suspect she wouldn't, but she did have several quite close friends. And some of them didn't even know where but she came from. Yeah, they thought she was English. And yeah. She let that out at a time that suited her, and it definitely wasn't 1961. No. So um, she probably would have, I would imagine, if she's changed her name by default rather than just a non the plume, she would travel under her BL travel. Tra That's what I've assumed too. Yeah. So back in London, she settles back into her home that, and realising that she's going to have to leave it. She can't afford it. And then there's a knock at the door and more business there. And she's like, what? What are you doing here? But she says, I really, really like a pot of English tea. So she invites him in and um, he says, you know, you think of me as some Hollywood King Midas with an empire and Mary Poppins would just be another brick. And then he tells her about, look, Mary Poppins is real to my daughters, thousands of children and adults. 
And he says, I'm sorry for letting you down. And he says, look, I have a Mr. Banks in my mind, but mine have a moustache. And he tells her about his own father, who he said he was a good man, but he didn't believe in Molly Coddling kids. So young Walt and his brother would go out to live in newspapers before they went to school. With their father. With the father, yeah, in the cold Missouri winters, and then do another two rounds after they got home from school. With the, um, the evening papers. Yeah, he, sa- he says, you know, my father believed, well, you don't need new shoes till the old ones are worn through. So, basically, she, she looks in a different in a different light, and he's, he's stressing the fact that, um, yeah, he came from a, a working class background himself. Just like he realises she did too. Yeah. Now that he's understood. And they've the actually, so they've got quite a bit in common. Reality? Well, the visit, London visit with Walt Disney. He, he, they did talk about, he did visit her in London, but that was during the 20 year negotiation. Yeah. It wasn't, well, it this, wasn't here. This like, particular trip chasing her is, is not. It's fiction, yeah. And if he did make a connection to try and win her over, it would have been before she signed the rights, which, which as we say, she'd already done by this time. Well, and truly. Um, and what the backstory for Disney, it was either Kelly Marcel or Sue Smith, I read, the, the, uh, the screenwriters, the scriptwriters for this movie, so Mr. Banks, not for Mary Poppins, said they were reading a biography, one of the many biographies of Walt Disney, and this story came up, told by Walt Disney. So whether he embellished it a, a bit to say, look, you know, working lab done good, or we're not sure, but it's definitely, you know, he definitely did grow up doing this newspaper round in Missouri. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, according to his own account, he did. Yeah. So we've got the scene where they're now sort of bonding and they know that they've got more in common than they would have thought. And uh, he convinces her that he'll look after her, Mary, please, you know, give me, trust me with her. And she does. And, and he realises as well that he now understands her point that Mary Poppins wasn't there to save the children. She was there to save so the, the father, father, who in then in turn would look after the children. Better. They wouldn't need saving. That's right. So yeah. it's all being wrapped up nicely. She signs the papers and she looks at the giant Mickey Mouse that she brought home with her uh, and when she does so. Yeah. Then we see, we cut for three years and Mary Poppins is having its world premiere in Los Angeles and Pamela's not invited because Walt's afraid she'll be a very difficult person and talk negatively to a journalist who asks her for an interview. And he says, anyway, it'd be more convenient for her to go to the premiere in London. Um, and she, yeah, she now has a maid who's rude to her. Yeah, and it, up to her agent says, why are you employees? I like her. She reminds me of me. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a brilliant line. It is. What was it she said from me? Can, can you, you make me a cup of tea? And she says, you're perfectly capable of doing that yourself. <laughs> yeah, it's a brilliant comeback. Uh, That's what she said on the plane when she was trying to put a yeah. luggage up. Did you hear that, that phrase several times? times. Said, Thank you, I'm perfectly capable of doing that myself. Um, yeah, and she, anyway, she, so she's back in London talking to her agent and she says, she says, I'm, I'm not interested. And he says, you haven't been invited, have you? But Mary Poppins wouldn't stand for that. And that's it. She's off on a plane and she just turns up, yeah. basically. She, she's on the same flight that we saw at the start of the film, at the same flight attendant oh, yeah. before, who asks if she needs help with a bag and then she recognises Pamela and uh, she lets her she take care I'm perfectly of her. Oh, yes, I remember right. now. <laughs> <laughs> we see Walt in his office in Hollywood. Uh, returns there and finds that Pamela is waiting for him. She points out that she didn't receive an invitation and must have gotten lost in the mail. Walt apologises and promises that we should a replacement. Back at her hotel, she asks the doorman to call for a taxi to take her to the premiere, but just then a limo pulls up and it's Ralph. Yeah, he says, oh, I heard someone was in town and might need a drive and think, okay, it's a little bit twee, but... It's nice. Yeah, Ralph's a lovely character. So, yeah. You see Pamela arrive at the famous Grand and Chinese Theatre, where various Disney characters are outside, mingling alongside some celebrities, including the cast of Mary Poppins. Before she gets out of the limo, Ralph whispers to her, this is your night. None of this would be possible without you. He helps her to the, uh, to the red carpet, where she walks unnoticed, except for a giant Mickey Mouse character, who interacts with her, takes her by the arm into the theatre. So what's the truth on that? It's- was she really left off the invitation She was list. left off the invitation list and she had to shame the Disney official. It wasn't Walt himself, but I don't know whether it was over the phone or via letter, but she had to shame him into, into getting an invitation, which she did get and she did attend the new the Los Angeles world premiere. But her fears, you can even see from the movie, are, are already coming true because the big banner headline across the cinema says, Walt Dis- no, presenting Walt Disney's Mary Poppins. You know, mm. nice. So she was probably... 
more right Man. than wrong about about yeah. worrying about what what Walt would do to monetize her creation. So back to the movie, we see Pamela watching a film. She looks around, sees everyone in the audience is laughing and singing along and having a, a good time. And the scenes in the film remind her of her history, which we're now familiar with by the flashbacks. By the end of the movie, she's got tears streaming down her face. And what this he, he leans forward and says, "It's all right, Mr. Banks is going to be all right." She says, "No, no, it's not that. I just can't abide cartoons." Um, good luck convincingly. Yeah. Um, and the final song, Let's Go Fly a Kite, uh, she can't help but sing along. Yeah, and what then there's a final flashback to young Ginty, isn't it? As he promises her, I will never leave you, um, as he's dying. Yeah. We cut back to the opening scenes of the film, remember with the blue sky shot, uh, Ginty sitting on the grass embracing her father. The, that prologue poem that we had at the start of the episode from Mary Poppins is being spoken again by her father. And the same weather vane turning to the west, and is that the shadow of an umbrella that we see uh, on the screen? So during the first part of the credit, so the film's now finished, uh, we've got resolution, the premiere's happened, the father's died, and maybe P.L. Travers is a bit more reconciled with the demons of the past. During the, while the credits are rolling, we see some black and white pictures of the real Pamela Travers, the real Walt Disney, the real Sherman Brothers, and the real Don DeGrati. Uh, and one of the drivers that inspired the Ralph Driver character, plus some of the concept art for the original Mary Poppins film. All the original stuff, all from the Disney archive. Mm. During the second part of the credits, the camera focuses on the old tape, a reel-to-reel tape recorder uh, next to a bowl of colourful jelly beans, while some recorded dialogue of the real Pamela, the Sherman brothers and Don is heard as they're discussing the script. The tape runs out and the screen turns to black. And we do have a clip here. This is just a few selected bits. And this is right at the end. I mean, basically, you have to watch all the way through the um, credits. ending credits. And this is right, right at the end. So a lot of people in this in- impatient age of, of watching movies and listening to songs and never listening to them all the way through will probably have missed this, but this is the real P.L. Travers. Now, who's reading? And go slowly. Right. Hold it. Now, I see the Cherry Tree Lane as not too townified on one side of the park. And we'll get you a photograph of uh, 50 Smith Street in order to uh, uh, see that the house is really quite like that, but it has more of a garden than my house. No, no, that we cannot have. That would be quite un-English. This is basically what we want to do here is use pretty much what you have in the book. Yes. Yes. Now, I want this tape measure to be used because it was a tape measure that my mother had when she was a little girl. And I think it would be very nice. Okay, so now the film's over and we've had that tape recording clip that you just heard and just want to stress that that is the real voice of P.L. Travers. The suggestion that she tape everything for the record in the movie is correct and those tapes do exist and they've remained in the Disney archive until this very day. And and just that short clip that you've had is an indication of how well uh, Emma Thompson channeled this grumpy author, Peter Travers. Um, And also, I think, our sympathy, she's such a watchable character. As I said, for me, there was something lovely about Emma Thompson and, and, you know, just in uh, her skill as an actor as well as something about her character. I just imagine she'd be a really good laugh to go out for a beer with and she'd just be a nice person. I might be completely wrong, but uh, I, that's the feeling you get. It's, like, it's a bit like Tom Hanks. Um, In wrapping up? The, the character, we do empathise with her. We do sympathise with her having creations on the part. But there's a very good point made by a, a very well-known British, maybe the, probably the BBC's main film critic, Mark Kermode, we just got a little clip of his take on both Emma Thompson's great performance, but also B.L. Travers in the movie. And this entire team attempting to create what is, in my opinion, one of the ten greatest movies ever made. And Emma Thompson being absolutely brilliantly haughty, crotchety, chippy, snippy about the fact that she doesn't like any of it. 
if I mean, obviously, there's a certain amount of liberty taking with the sorry, only a certain amount in terms of having to find a reconciliation between Disney and Travis. And the the screenplay does a very nice line of sort of, you know, walking just close enough to the truth and just close enough to the invention. And, you know, looking back and drawing kind of to some extent, kind of cod philosophical, uh, you know, this is the father figure. This is the, you know, the role model of Poppins. This is where this came from, but does so in a way which is very populist. And that's absolutely fine. I have no problem with that at all. And even though some people say, well, this, you know, she never ever reconciled with uh, with Poppins although there is a suggestion in the film that there is a sort of reconciliation it doesn't matter because the fact of the matter is Mary Poppins is a brilliant film no matter what P.L. Travers thought of it it doesn't matter I mean in the end they didn't make it for her um, so that's Mark Kermode's take on uh, a movie he's a huge fan of the Mary Poppins film one thing I just thought of and um, you know, I'll just remember from the film is uh, Walt Disney talked about a film magnate who tried to buy the mouse Mickey Mouse oh. from him do you remember that in the movie and he says he offered me $100,000 which I could have really done with at the time but I held on to that mouse this is when he's in London talking to him saying oh. look I had my own Mary Poppins it was the mouse yeah. and he managed to resist it he said so I do understand how difficult it is for you to relinquish control but you're just making the point there that this was the first movie where he didn't hold his own intellectual rights. Right? Yeah, like the Mickey Mouse stories were his own creation and he was, it was his intellectual property. Uh, the other movies that he's made until before now, Snow White and Sleeping Beauty and the like, they're not in copyright, no one owns them, they're in the no. public domain. And this is his first foray into using somebody else's material. And he went back to using, as we all know, you know, the sources of Apprentice, as we know the um, all of the fairy tales, Robin Hood. It was the Jungle Book, wasn't that? Jungle That's Book. That's another one I guess. But but Kipling would have been long and truly gone by then. It's Seventy years normally though. He was still alive during the First World War, so right, yeah. Um, maybe there was similar dealings with. So he might have. Been, his, but it was still his estate, estate though. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've come to the end of the movie. We've got uh, a little bit more to discuss though, because as we've suggested, that the timing two weeks is right. That she's a difficult woman. Other than not being able to comment on the actual dialogue in question, the facts of the movie are pretty close to historically accurate. Yeah. And if we were just to give it a score out of historical accuracy, I'd be very high just as a movie for these two weeks and a little bit uh, for the premiere. I don't know, what would you give it just based um, on our knowledge? I mean, for entertainment, it's a solid eight for it's me. A solid eight or nine. Yeah, eight, 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 eight pushing nine. I really, really enjoyed it. it, and, it, it and for that narrow history, you know, comparing the actual events to how people reacted and it's pretty good too. I, I do think, though, it uses little truths to tell a bigger lie. Uh, and we've been hard on movies before that have done that, like Gladiator and um, others that escape me at the moment. Because she never, never reconciled, as Mark Como made, made clear, and, and you read any of the stuff, she never liked the movie. She needed the money. Now, she did get $100,000 up front and then 5%, 5%, 5 of one of the most successful movies of all time, which made her a multi-millionaire in the 1960s. Yeah. And her Absolutely. Family. But I think she struggled viewing herself as a creative artist. I think she struggled with the knowledge that she had sold she out. She sold out, yeah. 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 And they, they suggest in the movie that she was okay with that at the end, that she was well on board and she never really was so they lose marks for that they had the disney by the end didn't they well one opinion i read was um it, it was in the guardian it wasn't actual uh, alex von tulzman i can't remember who it was who was writing it uh it might have been alex von tulzman i'm not sure but they said the, the wonderful thing is though you'll see the movie when you're a kid because most kids do what i didn't i did a pride childhood i didn't see Mary Poppins, but, uh, i don't think oh, my life is any less rich but they see the movie as a kid then they read the book when they're older, and actually there's so many more darker and more adult themed layers yes. that it's actually not a bad thing. And the point was made that when someone sees a film who does like to read books, which obviously not that many people do, I suppose, but, uh, especially these days, um, but the you know, the, the, there's a new level to discover, yeah. and it doesn't detract anything That's from the book. Point. That's a good so point. I mean, maybe I, it's not that much of a negative. Uh, yeah, that's right. So, look, even if we give it reasonably high scores, maybe seven for history as far as the movie goes, maybe a bit less. Uh, I, I'm thinking six because uh, I've still got a down on Disney for what they did to play the artist's story. 
So I'm not going to be nice to them. Okay. If it's six and a half to seven, if it's between six and seven, I'm going to round it round down. Round it down. Okay, well, let's, just, let's leave it around that. Just because they implied that actually Walt Disney charmed um, P.L. Travers until she agreed that Mary yeah, Poppins was the big reveal. In, she did cry at the premiere, apparently, but it was, wasn't t- it was tears of rejection and frustration really. and. She and was yeah. she was polite about the movie on the day, you know. She said that they got yes. some elements right, uh, and she appreciated that, and it was nice and and, and was enjoyable. There something this, someone said, um, "Did you enjoy the movie?" She said, "Yes." Well, this sort of adaptation from a book like mine is always going to be difficult, but yes, it was lovely. Yeah, and it's sort of like whoa, damned with faint praise. But then, in reality, too, she took Disney aside after the premiere and said to him, "Now." Let's talk about re-editing it and getting rid of the animations and, and you know, changing the film after it's been a big success. And he just shut it down straight away and said, yeah. that ship sailed. Yeah, that's the, the, the famous line in the auto, in the biographies, isn't it, where he says, yeah, Pamela, that ship sailed. sailed. So what the film does fudge or not get right, it's really by uh, omission. And that's that they don't delve into the lifestyle at all of with P.L. Travers. No, she comes across as a maiden arm. Yeah. She was a spinster. Which, maybe by then, she was behaving like that a bit, because she... Anyway, let's let's get on to her personality a little bit. She is, in the film, very prim and proper, and often she would be, but she apparently had a very flirty and sexual side. And she liked to party. She liked, she liked to go to bars and drink. She was very liberated. Yep, she flirted with a lot of men, was known for that. In, however, in 1927... For 10 years, she had a female partner, Madge Burnham. They lived together for 10 years in London and Sussex, and most of the histories that I've seen uh, suggest that this was definitely a sexual relationship, so it's likely that she was bisexual. Yep. Um, reinvent herself a number of times, called herself Mrs. Travers, even though she never married, but she felt it was more respectable. When she got to a certain age. Yeah. She was an Australian actress, then she became a single British author, and, um, and then suddenly just became a missus. She was given some honorary literary degrees and insisted on being referred to as Dr. Travers. And yeah, she embraced the role of spinster or crone, in her words, and enjoyed playing the curmudgeon to American students when she uh, was also in residence at two American universities. Right. At the start of the film, we do see a Buddha statue in her London home and a suggestion that she might have been meditating. And this is a very small hint as to how important spiritualism was to her. Throughout her life, she followed various gurus and religions. Now, after she arrived in London, she became a follower of Irish writer and intellectual George William Russell, known as A.E. for short for some reason. He introduced her to theosophy, which is the, the belief that there's spirits out there and under the right circumstances you communicate with the other side. She also, um, during her life, she dabbled in Taoism, Sufism, and, a, and a, spent a couple of summers doing some spiritual stuff in the, with the Navajo in North America. She then uh, went into the orbit of a Russian self-proclaimed guru, Ivanovich Gurdjieff, who promoted a, a veneer of intellectual philosophy with a blend of Hinduism, Orientalism and the occult, which apparently was right up Pamela Street, mixing religion and the occult. But the biggest omission of the film? Yeah, um, there's, there's a great bit where um, Walt Disney says, do you have like, family back, back in London? London? She says no, well, sort of, sort of. and then no. doesn't expand on it. And um, the details are a bit strange because at 40, one of her reinventions was to become a mother. And through a link to the Irish literary scene, she found out about a poor Irish couple somehow related to one of the literary figures she admired. And they had many children and given birth to twin boys. In 1939. In 39, yeah. Pamela wanted to adopt one and consulted her astrologer as to which one she should take. She was advised to select the older and she named him Camillus, which is very classical in Roman. Um, she never told her son of the adoption and grew up thinking, he grew up thinking she was his natural mother. And at the age of 17, his twin brother, who knew about the adoption, came to London and knocked on their door. Pamela refused to allow him in and then all the ruckus, Pamela uh, learned the truth of his origin. He was furious and stormed off to find his brother in a local pub. Um, yeah, he never forgave her. He never forgave her, no. For not being... But I suppose that's that's the problem for the a parent of an adopted child who was adopted in their infancy. It was very, when is the right age? It's very common in uh, my day when I was young. We knew of some people that had adopted children, and they did not want to tell them that they weren't, weren't natural born. They didn't want them to think that they were somehow inferior or second class citizens. Whereas now, because of genetics and things you want to avoid, you really do want to know where your family comes from. I guess. 
Yeah. It was, it was a very tough call though, and it ruined Camilla's life. He he was already you know, seventeen, and he met his twin brother. They were both down the pub, you yeah, know, underage drinking, and he had a very pretty hard. Yeah, he, he had a hard life, which again was self inflicted. Uh, and uh, he was a drinker. He he died. Did she outlive him? No, no, no. Oh yes, she, she did. He died. She died in ninety six, and he died in two thousand and one, I think. Oh, so 2011, no. 2011. Right, so she didn't outlive him. She did not outlive him, but no. she, she adopted him when she was 40. Yeah. You know, and yeah, well, she, she still outlived him in that sense, but yeah, she, but she still So she was already pretty old when, yeah. she, when she became a mother for the first time, as I say. Yeah. But she's a fascinating character. She's very self-assured in many ways. All this dabbling with uh, different religions, trying to find herself at the same time. But she, yeah, amazing woman. If you like her all over, she's had a big impact. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so I think that wraps us up. Did we give it? So we, we both agree eight for entertainment. Yeah, eight for entertainment and six, six and a half. Six to seven. You Four give it six. seven, I'll give it six. Okay. Um, which is reasonable. Um, but it is a, it's a brilliant film. Really watch it. Laugh out loud, funny, and quite touching without being cloying, cloying at all. Yeah. So we will now take our month's holiday. Woohoo! And we'll be back on Sunday the 1st of July with Mrs. Brown, Dame Judy Dench, and Billy Connolly playing Queen Victoria and John Brown. Okay, thanks for your time. See you in a month. Bye-bye now. Soapbox leader, break it off. Home and tea. For once you deserve it. Well done, everybody.